and of course, uh, our natural forces like magnetic fields are easy to see if you set it up right. You get a magnet, a bunch of you know, like metallic particles, sort of flip them up in the air, and what do you see? You actually see the patterns, right? It's the invisible patterns that are happening in our world all around us. So I'd like you to pause for a moment and think about something that you do uh, that you know has invisible aspects in it, but we just never see it that way or we never even think about it. And how powerful that could be if you could visualize that for someone. What kind of understanding could we unlock by doing that for people? One of my favorite examples, of course, is um, you know, the New York City subway system or, or you know, any big metro system you would find around the world. We have a very clear signage, by the way. I, I think that's perfectly clear. I, I see what trains are running. I see the connections. But I don't see where. And, and of course, I can like, hold up my phone and I can see you know, like whatever. But that's, that's a little much, right? It's asking a little much. But soon, uh, we will be able to see exactly where things go without too much trouble. I, I'm not worried about the hardware. The hardware will come around. Everybody will be able to do this in one way or another, with their phones, with their glasses, like projected. It doesn't matter. The important part is I can actually see where my train's going to go. I can see the timing. I can see the connection. In the same way, um, I always, when I go to the airport, I always forget where I park. I have to take a picture right, of my sad, but I have to take a picture of the parking spot. Until recently, I noticed um, there was something invisible happening in the way that my phone was going to help me find my car, right? Through artificial intelligence and GPS and some other, you know, secret sauce, my phone started reminding me of where I parked without me asking, right? It just started telling me, by the way, you actually parked here. I thought that was like a really great example of something invisible. It didn't even come to mind, never even thought, never asked my phone to tell me that, but it did because it knew it was useful. This is uh, in a really important trend with many things that we're doing right now. And for reading, you know, of course, I told you I, I've been working in uh, books and information documents for um, a long time. When we did Acrobat uh, way back when, I, I had this thought that nobody is ever going to read these things because it's uncomfortable sitting at a computer, like sitting upright at a computer reading an electronic document. Like, like how dumb is that? Uh, but it, it sort of caught on over time because we got laptops, then we got iPads, it started to become more comfortable to read. But there's an evolution to this reading. And the invisible thing that we do when we're reading is we're forming, again, like, you know, narratives in our mind. We, you know, maybe envision certain places or um, sort of see what a character may look like. But we can bring that to life now, and we do, right, through all the XR technologies we have. If you're reading Ready Player One, why can't you see scenes acted out? You can, right? And people are already doing this. But a great example of this, this scene was, you know, was contained within that narrative. And I probably had it in some form in my mind's eye, but maybe not the way the author intended. So another great example of, of bringing something to life. Um, something else with textbooks in particular, there's always uh, labs, right? There's always something that you need to get hands on to really understand how something works. And so why not you know, take it out of the, this realm of being you know, a pure textbook and make it into something much more interactive, right? Something that's immersive so I can actually play around with it, read the information in a different way and understand it. And uh, my favorite example is where productivity is going. There's so much, there's so much, whether you want to call it metadata or um, related information or things that we leave to the detail that can be surfaced by using XR technology. So to me, this is the most inspiring example that I saw of where productivity is going. Now I know all of you want to look that cool when you're using Office, right? Because th that guy looked pretty cool when he was using Office. I joke, but, but I think it's very true. That is 
going to be what our immersive experiences will be like. The, the things that we can't see, the mental models, the way processes work, living systems, marketplaces, they'll be in our space. They'll be around us. They'll be set free from the screens and the books and the other things that we um, you know, have encapsulated the, you know, within right now. But that's clearly where we're going. Right? We're going to be bringing things into our personal space, into our workspace. And you'll see, um, you know, it's not just information, right? It can be your entire room scale, you know, computing environment will be done in this way. Right now, these are things that, you know, again, we, um, we know them, right? Like we know all this stuff. If you're going into a meeting, you know exactly what's being discussed. It may not be written down, it may not be on a board, it may not be on a slide but you understand what it is, and now this technology helps us bring it to life, right? It helps us surface it in a super interesting visual way. Data is exactly the same way. Remember I talked about the time aspect, right? The temporal aspect of data is fascinating. We know that the data is constantly changing, but we never depict it that way. Like these are some excellent examples of showing uh, data morphing over time, right? And you can stop this video at any point and see a snapshot, but that's not the point. The point that is that we never visualize things over time. We always take snapshots. Yes, maybe it's easier to understand, it's more clear, but there's no reason why we shouldn't start to be uh, more concerned about showing how things get surfaced in this way. It's all there. You know, we have the tech, we have the techniques. We've been doing this as, like these are super expensive special cases, right? Like it's very hard to find a piece of off-the-shelf software or tool that lets you do this in a fluid manner. Um, they exist, but not enough. So this is just, again, one snapshot from that sequence. So can I understand this? No. Do I know that it's happening over time? Yeah, I've seen this notation, right? I've seen this visual flow notation before. I understand that there's something more that's happening here, right? I, I know in my mind there's something more to it. So um, part of this whole, pre so as creators, right, part of this whole process is how do we surface, I keep using the word surface, how do we surface these invisible things? So there's two parts for me, right? There's the envisioning part. And, and you can take whatever process you want, it doesn't really matter. The, this is how I do it, so I thought I would share and just talk a little bit about this. When I go to envision something, and this is something that you know, I, I talked about in my first book, I had a research, I actually spend my time observing the world around me, looking for small detail, big things maybe I missed. I imagine what could be, what's the optimal, right? What is the absolute best way to do this? I visualize it in a number of ways, which I'm gonna show you, we're gonna go through really quick. I prototype it in some way to make it real. The reason I prototype it is that I need to share it, right? It's, it's no good to me if I keep it by myself. If I share it, now I can have a conversation. And then you should, we're all too busy to do this, but you should reflect when you do this kind of envisioning. So what happened? Did I actually get it right? Did the people I showed it to understand what I was trying to do? So the next part is uh, storytelling. So storytelling starts the other way for me, right? I try to reflect first, well, what, what is it that I'm trying to talk about? And, I, and sort of, you know, like spend a little few minutes before you just dive in and start creating whatever you're creating. Identify the key parts, right? Like what are the, the story arcs? Like what are the key things to get across? What kind of narrative am I gonna use, right? Am I gonna talk? Do I need slides? Like, like what is it exactly? Personalize it to the audience so it's relevant for you. Try to captivate people and then uh, listen to what they have to say, right? So after you do this, um, when you do your story, like everybody talks about storytelling, data storytelling, blah, it doesn't matter, right? You're just trying to communicate in some way, but there is so much that you can't get to because of the medium that you're using or the amount of time you have or the technology at your disposal. That's what I wanna try to get to with surfacing, right? Surfacing helps both parts of this, right? Envisioning and storytelling, gotta have both to surface the invisible in a very powerful way. So now let's talk about design, right? Everybody here um, cares a lot about design, I presume. Uh, we know that through this technology, we can sort of use this transformer power on demand sort of approach to showing the invisible elements, right? They don't have to always be shown. You don't always have to hit somebody over the head with, with these things. You can sort of have a, an elegant resting state and at the right time, your piece of information or data or like whatever, you know, video, music, doesn't matter, it comes to life, right? And you see all those extra elements. It doesn't have to be there all the time. The same applies to artwork. So this is a, one of my sister Sharon's paintings. 
On the far left, you see that she would take maps and she would sort of see something in the map and she would bring it to life. But this actually has multiple layers, right? Just like everything in life, right? There's like metadata at every level. There's, there's different um, types of things. So in the center, you see that she gave you know, her idea some structure. And on the far right was the original, right? That was, it was just a map. Nobody saw what she saw, but she was able to surface the invisible in this way. Like super, so it, this applies to art as well as it does to science or business or anything else. Because of our environments, uh, ambient computing will, you know, is, is now starting to get more popular. It will be prevalent very quickly. And in this world, um, there will be things that we didn't notice that get surfaced to us. Like, yes, we'll be advertised to, but there'll be other aspects that we need to pay attention to. So think about what could we, if we had the opportunity, what could we share with people in our um, you know, ambient computing environments? And then finally, room scale data. This is like a real game changer. If you ever have the chance to get into a VR experience or mixed reality spatial computing experience where your data, something that you are familiar with, is actually laid out at room scale, it, it's like life altering. You realize finally, wow, this, this is exactly what I had maybe in my mind's eye, but I, I never got to see it this way. So again, when you, this is taking something that was in our minds and making it real, super powerful. And then um, from a design aspect, we have to consider that there's not just devices anymore, right? There's robots, there's smart rooms, there's smart buildings. There, there's all kinds of things that we need to take into account when we're designing to surface these things because it could feel creepy and like something's always watching me. The truth is something is always watching you. But we as designers have to sort of take that into account. And of course, this is at the very beginning, right? We are at the, the very beginning still of what we're doing with XR in general. We have to be inclusive as designers. It's our responsibility, right? Yes, it should be everybody's responsibility on the team, but especially um, the designers have to really, really dig in and make sure that we're designing from the very beginning for everybody, right? Everyone should be able to explore and get something from the work that we're doing. Uh, I tend to be an optimist, you know? So given that there's some issues ahead of us, I'm still like very, very uh, excited about the future. So I wanna take you through a process that I think maybe would help you to try to do your design work, your creative work. I, I call it fast design because in my work I have to go very quickly. There's a lot of stuff happening all the time. I sort of boil down my design process into three things, right? It starts with just getting to a, from A to B as quickly as possible. Like forget about what they taught you in school, forget about your process, just imagine the optimal, right? And try to get there as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna do an example with you. Okay, so there's three parts for me, right? Essence, personality, and speed, right? And those are the only things you should worry about when you're trying to go fast to design something that you wanna surface, right? Something that you wanna get to as quickly as possible. The first part is essence, right? So we all know the essence of something is sort of the core, but it's more on the emotional side of things, right? It's not, it's not the exact function, right? Essence does not mean function. Essence is a little squishy. Right, so if we had like some amazing new project that we we're working on together, right? Like let's say we're making like this cool new thing. Give me an example of like an XR project you're working on. We'll find the essence really quick. Yes. Tell me more. Okay, okay, so, um, so doing some lab tests, right? So, so what is the essence of that? task is it is it the task is it actually performing the test no you're trying to learn something right so in that particular case so you can use this to you know apply this to anything you need to find the essence of it and it's on the people side to know how to visualize it how to bring it to life in the proper way the personality um, is very easy to determine I always ask people if this thing this experience that we're designing product service like doesn't matter device if it was a person what would its personality be Right? Is it very quiet? Is it inquisitive? Right? Is it clever? And if you start asking yourself this question, you'll very quickly get to how you need to portray this. So even something like I showed you with data visualization, that actually has a personality, right? It can be uh, like very, very sexy and cool. It could be very factual, right? Like very clinical. And then the speed part is super important too. I always tell people, right? You know, some people, um, designers sometimes overthink. I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes overthink things. And I always sort of challenge them to just imagine the optimal, right? Just imagine the best possible outcome of this thing that you're designing for XR. What is it? 
What does it feel like? What's the experience? Forget about, you know, well, we don't have this and this is not coming out till next year and nobody's ever been able to do that. Forget about that. Go to the optimal and then figure out how to come backwards, right, slowly. And you're gonna have to make some leaps to get there. But still, if you try to go as fast as you can to get there, um, you're gonna get something through fast design that is probably um, closer to what your, your first instinct was, right? Your gut instinct about how to visualize something. So that's just my tip. This is how I like to work when I'm going fast. I hope that you would try this out because there's lots that we can do if we just go faster. So now let's talk about envisioning. Uh, when we're trying to envision in XR, there's a couple things I just wanted to, to sort of go through with you because there's some tools and techniques that I've learned to use um, that may be very helpful. All right, so when you're envisioning, you're essentially trying to come up with a way to show someone else something that's in your mind, right? It's not there. It could be there. If you're wearing a headset, has special optics, okay, you can say it's there, it's a hologram. Um, so when I wrote this book, I went through a bunch of steps in order to do this, and what I found when I was testing things out is that people love holograms, we always have, right? Like since the very beginning of, you know, when people seeing Princess Leia and Star Wars, there, there's something innate about um, holograms, digital content, and optics that make us stop. It's actually a very arresting, it's startling. We know that you know, we're getting more into projection. I actually wanted to show you an example of that. You know, like, so we know very well, um, you get to see holograms all the time with HoloLens, but uh, sort of emerging now, uh, like the, this light form projector, we are gonna be able to project holograms and digital content into our environments much more easily very soon. Not soon enough, of course, for all of us, but this opens up all kinds of possibilities for bringing things to light in a way that we hadn't thought of before because now they're not trapped, right? It's not just for me, it's for everybody who happens to be in the same space as me. And of course, the best example of um, holograms is you know, digital assistant, right, in a holographic form. So embodied AI is being done, not at this level, right, because it's being projected, but we're getting there very quickly. So as designers, as creative people, as people trying to bring things to light, you have to think about the optimal, and this clearly, Tony Stark had the optimal for a digital assistant. But um, all this said, remember I, I said, you know, people are always the most important part. It's, it's your imagination that is really the best tool. It's gonna be the highest fidelity, fastest, and um, I'm gonna actually do a little a test here with you. What do you see when you see this? It's like some kind of uh, emergency light system, right? You see, like see over a door. When I look at this, I see a chameleon. Do you see a chameleon? Okay, that's envisioning, right? That's what you should be doing. You should be walking around the world and looking for things like this. It happens to me uh, more often than I would like. This is a lobby in, in MoMA, right, in New York City. Um, I look at this, I don't see a bunch of empty stools. I see a family, you know, out for like a weekend, a visit to the museum, and of course there's a dinosaur on the patio because there's always a dinosaur on the patio, right, that the kid's playing with. And so I, I can't help uh, but sort of have my mind fill these things in. And I, I bet, I bet that you actually do this in your own way. I bet when you hear somebody talking, when you read something, when you're working on a report, when you're doing something with your friends or family, you're seeing these things. But at, through envisioning, we get to bring them to life enough to share, right? And so as uh, creatives, you know, we can choose to do this whenever we want. We usually do envisioning at the very beginning of a project, but that's not the only time it's helpful. Your project teams will benefit if you can actually um, get to this more quickly, like in different parts of the project. So a few tools and techniques. Um, what I found is that there are some tools that are super persuasive. I'm gonna talk to you about persuasion. Uh, just recording something, right? Like making a quick memo for yourself, easy way to envision something, right? It's like flip on your phone, take a note. Using your camera, um, you'll notice that in a lot of my work, um, I take pictures of, of things that are uh, empty spaces because I see something, I'm like, eh, I don't know where, what goes there. I know something goes there, I'm gonna come back to it later. So in my camera roll, I have tons of empty pictures. Uh, PowerPoint is one of the most powerful envisioning tools on the planet, nobody knows it, right? It has so much, you can do 3D objects, you can do animation, right? It has sound. It can compose just about anything you can think of with video, right? So um, I could take this picture, throw it into PowerPoint, and just sketch on top of it, right? Like I can use my, my little pen, I can use a mouse, doesn't matter. I can make very quick sketches. If you have time and you understand Photoshop, that's another fantastic way to get high fidelity visualizations, right, and, and envisioning done. Mental Canvas, fantastic tool. If you haven't seen this running on a surface, 
you can use uh, like the little Microsoft Surface dial to control the zooming, but it's actually sketching in 3D. So like, you know, we're like 3D creatures. We all think in 3D because we were at this conference, but you can actually see your sketching, like the actual flat, what was flat sketching in 3D. It's an amazing, amazing tool. It's, it's something that I can't even describe it. You would just have to see it for yourself. Go to Mental Canvas and check it out. Mixed Reality Viewer, for people who have uh, Surface laptops, you can actually use your, your laptop camera uh, to inject holograms into any scene. People don't really know that, but, but you can. It's like built into Windows on, on every single Surface. You can do that. Like easily, it's like hold it up, find an object, stick it in the scene, like done. Uh, you can see like this little dinosaur that I, I put in the uh, build conference, right? A uh, video, of course, right? You know, everybody knows that video is the fastest way to capture your ideas. It is actually the most powerful, too, as it turns out. And um, Tilt Brush, if you have the time and you have the VR rig, and now, like with the Quest, you know, untethered, you can actually draw to envision things in 3D. Fantastic tool, super useful if you're trying to do something quick to show somebody in device, right, in the space, what you're trying to get to, and sound, right? Remember, I started off by saying, sound is the most powerful and overlooked trigger catalyst for some of these types of things that we do. And so um, Audition is a fantastic tool to edit and sort of fine tune what you're doing. Adobe Dimensions allows you to take uh, scenes, whether it's like photographs, and drop like, essentially products into them, um, texture map them, light them properly, it's fantastic. And uh, Paint 3D is actually quite useful, believe it or not, for doing this kind of stuff. There are lots of free visualization tools like Sandance that allow you to do things um, not quite like this, but this is me exploring I need to get a, a few things across with data viz that it's not letting me do about atmospherics and cinematic, right? I, I'm very, um, very interested in the idea of cinematic visualization. So that kind of tool lets us do that. Um, you don't, you probably can't see this, but this object is actually a 3D cat sitting on this. It's just in a picture. I just placed it there, but you can rotate it, animate it, scale it. Unity uh, and Visual Studio, fantastic tool set together to get your ideas done. You know, I, I had to make a poster, believe it or not, and I, I did it in Unity because I didn't have a spaceship in the right angle, you know, the space station. And then finally, there's no substitute when you're envisioning for seeing things in a headset, right? Actually seeing it. So now onto the storytelling. Remember I said there's the envisioning part and the storytelling part. So I just covered very quickly the envisioning part. Now I'm gonna change over to storytelling. So for any type of storytelling, you have to have, you know, a willing audience. Uh, I end up talking to holograms sometimes because nobody's around. Okay, they, they tend to be pretty good listeners. Um, in this new book that I wrote, uh, I tried to sort of project forward what happens when AI is injected into this process of dealing with holograms and digital content. Where does that take us? And so, again, the book is free. Find out for yourself by reading it. I would love to have a conversation with you about it also. Uh, but I did get some storytelling insights uh, by working on that. And the first is, as designers, we're often very guilty of going for first impression, right? It's a conscious effort. We have to blow somebody away with their very first impression of something. And the truth is, the first impression is not nearly as important as what happens after. What are the questions that people form? What can they find out next? What are the steps? And for me, um, you have to think about not just stopping at first impression. It's a conscious effort. So as I said, people are absolutely spellbound by digital content, whether it's inside of a VR headset, in a mixed reality rig, seeing projections of holograms. It's something as a storyteller that you should play on. Uh, being grounded, for me, uh, mixed reality is, is my favorite medium because I like to see the real world. I like to, to see what can happen in the real world. I mean, teleporting to a different place is fantastic, but uh, for me, it's about being able to add things to my space. And finally, uh, when you do a good job of surfacing the invisible, you really generate more questions and you inspire more things than you ever thought you were going to initially. We are sort of stuck right now in the narrative phase. We all know that we should be having conversations like we have with our Alexa, like we have with our Siri um, in the device. And, and we're starting to get there. But this is really what unlocks this whole storytelling thing. So, because storytelling is not a one-way medium, right? It's like, yes, you're telling me a story, I'm watching a movie, I'm you know, like listening to a podcast, but I have questions. You know, I, I, wanna, I wanna actually get in here. This is what's gonna allow us to do that, pushing more for the conversational. So here's a few examples that I put together of storytelling. So for me, um, I did this first 
you know, in an envisioning exercise, but it was not about envisioning. It was about telling a story. The story I wanted to tell with this was, you know, instead of having these shared office places where, you know, people just sit down and chit chat, why can't we actually reuse that for remote teleconferencing, right, for telepresence? So I can uh, interact with colleagues that aren't there. Use spaces like tables to actually look at products and services and objects. When you're at a conference like this, why can't we use the shared space that's right outside the door instead of just being a table and chairs for wayfinding? Why can't that be, but this is sort of like, I pose these questions to myself when I'm working on these types of things. What am I trying to communicate? What story am I telling by drawing this picture? And I would ask you, the next time you do something creative, right, whether it's putting together you know, a report for your team, doing something on the artistic side, what story is it that you're telling it? And be aware of that. Have it be part, have, make sure it shows up in the work because there's always a story. Same thing with data centers. You know, this, this um, actually data center is on the campus of um, Illinois. It's, um, I think, the biggest supercomputer in the country that's declassified. And so I imagined, what if I got to walk around in my own data, something I understood, something that made complete sense to me? What could I do with that? Could it be interactive? Could it be like moving bricks or Legos? Could working with data really be that way? So that was my story. Same thing with this. So this, this is a lunchroom in Seoul, Korea. And you can imagine people go there and they're using their phones and they're maybe on their laptop or chatting with their friends. But today, if you were in a headset, like a, a Quest or a HoloLens or whatever, nobody else could see what you were doing, right? It's very, very um, isolated. It doesn't have to be, and it won't be, right? It will not be in the future. We will be able to see, depending on your security settings and privacy settings, all of the content that you're interacting with. So just as I can see that you're reading a book, I will see that you're watching a soccer match. Just as I see that you're chit-chatting about you know, like a new fashion show, I'll actually be able to see what it is you're talking about. And so these types of situations, this was my conversation with myself, like what, what is that really like? Are we gonna like that? Are we gonna not like that? What are the ethics? What's the security around this? Uh, even with rooms, right? So the story is, I wanna take a like, you know, plain dumpy old conference room and, and make it really great. So I'm trying to tell a story that this is possible, right? That's, that's the story I was telling my manager, this is possible, right? It wasn't an exact plan. And then we can sort of say, well, I'm like, you know, we can clean it out, it'll be really beautiful, we'll fill it with robots, like it'll be great, right? We should to totally do this. I was telling a story, right? Using pictures to help tell a story. And then uh, combining AI and XR, this is what I talk about in the book quite a bit. There's three components for me when you do this, right? So the AI is, is working over the data for the most part, machine learning, reinforcement learning, we're like mining things, getting insights. The XR part is really the representation, right? In, in any form, it doesn't matter. And then the EQ, the emotional part of it, is really the action. So remember I said, when you do something, there's, you're, you're trying to invoke something, right? It's either I'm trying to be clear or I need you to do something. And so as designers, we should keep all three of these things in mind as we're designing things, as we're surfacing things that people can't see today. What action do I expect them to take now that they can see it? Information objects, which are these things that are just digital constructs to hold all of this, uh, will be able to be auto-authored by our system tools that we have now, whether it's things like Word or you know, specialized uh, programs you know, for doing design and layout or modeling and animation. It doesn't matter, AI will be added to those to do things on your behalf. And as storytellers, as creatives, it's our responsibility to ask for the things that we need and not to settle. There's a lot to talk about with ethics, right? So as people who care a lot about storytelling, being able to get the right message across, there's a line that we can easily cross where we're persuading rather than communicating. Would you trust these pandas and kitties? Of course you would. They're, they're cute, right? You're like, what could they possibly do that was bad? Now imagine the information, the images, the videos, the models, the XR experiences that you use today, um, having something below the surface that you can't see, right? And there's lots of examples of this every day in the news, right? There are things happening in the background that we don't see. And so we have to be careful to not be persuaded without having a really good understanding of what we're being shown. And so that's on us, right? As creatives, as designers, again, we have to be the ones pointing this out. We tend to be the ones in our work groups 
that look across, that look deeper, that ask the questions, that care about people. And persuasion is something that, that we need to really keep our eye on. And uh, I'm, I'm here to say, it's like, there's a lot to think about with persuasion. Like, I'm actually a big fan of persuasion. I'm a designer. I'll lie, cheat, and steal to get my point across. Don't care. But lots of people do. We can't, we can't let persuasion in the work that we're doing be overriding, right? There needs to be some kind of checks and balances. And so as we start to work on all of this, right, as we turn our um, envisioning and our storytelling into things that people can actually dig into, it's more of an exploration now, right? It's not about one-way communication, right? When we surface things that we can't see, now I can ask questions, now I can interact, I can change it, play what if. That's what we're getting to. That's the important part of all this, right? So Charlie Fink's book, uh, you know, is like an AR-enabled book. It's fantastic, right? It's just, it's one simple example of exploring rather than just consuming. Very easy example to see where this takes us. And then um, something that I really wanted to cover with you, smart data is a concept that has been around for a while. It's when you take artificial intelligence, machine learning, like you know, whatever buzzwords you want to add, but you apply it to data in such a way that you get something unexpected, right? So data blades, right? Being able to slice through data uh, very, very fluidly. Being able to find outliers in plots automatically without having to try. Um, data centers, actually being able to show you what's happening at a particular time, right? Not just being, you know, racks of servers, but actually being able to see the information flowing, seeing the invisible, seeing the unseen in a data center is super powerful. Data towers uh, was something that I explored because we have so much that's locked up in these servers, right? So much that's locked up in our databases today, we almost have no idea what we're sitting on top of, right? And they are like literally towers of data that we have to sort through. Geoshaping is a quick way to use mapping and spatial uh, orientation to understand something a bit better. And then uh, we get back into the cinematic aspect. So you can imagine uh, the concept of data fog, right? It's just too much to sort through. And I, again, I, I love the theatrical elements. So we all have an opportunity to start looking at theatrical, cinematic, um, more dramatic presentation of information. It doesn't have to be cut and dry, right? It doesn't have to be that, that perfect bar chart. We can explore. Same thing with storms, right, or in bridges. These are all things that we should be curious about and want to go after. Information spaces have been around for quite a while, uh, but they are one of the ways that I've tried to um, get experiment with how to present my information in my book. This was, uh, some of you probably recognize this work from uh, the MIT Media Lab like decades ago now, but this was a precursor to looking at information in three space, right? Being able to see the relationships between numbers in a new, completely uh, interesting way. Uh, this is part of uh, a piece that was done by Flow Immersive. This is actually Hamlet by Shakespeare, done in a way that's completely immersive. So you actually feel like you're in a type sculpture, but it's moving, right? It's, it's kinetic. It has energy. It's information. It's a play that you're very familiar with displayed in a completely new way, right? This, this is, again, a perfect example of things that are invisible to us, right? We, we would never think of looking at this information structured in that way. So if you take out your phones, uh, if you have a sec, and you uh, just hold it up, take a picture of this QR code, or you just point it at this QR code, you should see a button show up. You can actually open up an, an immersive guide to my new book that was done by Jason Marsh of Flow Immersive that'll give you an idea of what's inside the book without having to go through the whole thing. That's my kind of application, right? I'm a scanner, don't really like to read very much anymore, so I'm quite happy that Jason was able to hook this up. So I invite you, you can find this online. Uh, it's actually in, in the first chapter of the book itself. It's a great way to explore something very quickly without having to go through it in a conventional way. Again, uses envisioning and storytelling to be able to bring something together in a completely new way. Sort of looks a little bit like this. And then uh, one of my colleagues at Microsoft, Dun Young Park, did beautiful typographic sculpture as part of um, a piece that, that he's been working on this program called uh, Typography Insight for quite a while. This is an XR. But this opens up a lot of possibilities, too. Just think about this. Think about all the things that you could do uh, from an artistic you know, or theatrical way 
that you were never able to do before. Because the technology is there, we just have to envision it. Like whatever we can imagine, we can do now. When you bring envisioning and storytelling together, I'll sort of end with a very quick example. Again, I, I look at empty spaces and I, my mind fills them in right away. I looked at this and thought, oh, something, you know, some sculpture, painting, something belongs there that's not there right now, clearly. So I went off and did a little bit of research, right? When I was in New York, I was like, okay, I'm gonna find out how people experience paintings and, and sculpture today, just to sort of orient me. What I found was some people are super enthralled and like interested in everything that, you know, the curators and, and people are talking about. And some people could care less. They're like, ah, eh, painting, whatever, you know, like famous dead guy, don't care. But I took that and said, you know what? Maybe this is really is about exploration and not about passive consumption. Maybe the way to surface the most uh, important parts are to put some people in the scene. So I got some people, you know, I have an observer. I put one of my sister's paintings in the work and started to look at that and think about, okay, what is invisible about this? What, what is there? Like, what do I know about this painting that's just not shown? Obviously the artist, right? So why don't we just put the artist in the scene? Why don't we put a little bit of background about what was the artist thinking when she was creating this? You know, maybe there's a way to zoom in and actually see the detail in this piece. Maybe there's a way to see more of her work, right? So it's not just about one piece and one painting. So in this way, I was thinking, okay, I, I'm envisioning, I'm imagining what it could be like, but I'm working on the storytelling to surface the invisible, to show what's not there normally when we see our objects. And I'm not thinking about the devices, I'm not thinking about you know, like, what do I have to do to actually make this happen? I'm thinking more about the creative part of it. And then I brought this all into Unity, um, did a very quick mock-up so that I could look at it in the HoloLens. What I found was that you can only get, you know, so close before things started to fall apart. There were some issues that I had to resolve, but I was able to actually go from thought to working prototype very quickly to see if this was gonna work. And that's sort of what I'm leaving you with by using fast design, by using all the tools that I showed you earlier you could go really fast to do whatever you do to see if it's gonna work, to try it out. And that's what I'm hoping uh, we're gonna get to do to surface all these amazing invisible things. So for you, I would say keep your eyes open, look around the world, imagine what could be. Because anything can be, right? Anything that you can imagine, we're now capable of doing, right? We have the technology, we have the smart people, we have the opportunity, the medium is in place, the platforms are in place. So I'll sort of leave you with this thought. What if anything at all could be visible? And of course, it can. So uh, that was surfacing the invisible. I wanna remind you that I will be signing my book at the end of this talk. You can get it for free, Amazon Kindle, uh, and tell your friends, it'll be free for all of AWE. And I would love for people to read it. I would love to have conversations with you. I, I hope this was helpful. Was, was this helpful at all for you to think about how to like sort of surface it? <laughs>